This episode is brought to you by Indie Film Hustle Academy, where filmmakers and screenwriters go to learn from top Hollywood industry professionals. Learn more at ifhacademy.com. You've been able to tap into something, uh, a, fra- a kind of filmmaking I, I kind of coined, which is nostalgia filmmaking. You are a, you're attaching your 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 film to your to an existing audience that's really all about nostalgia. So all those VHS documentaries, um, all the uh, documentaries on, uh, you know, uh, like oh that was that one at HBO about the the the, the water theme park that killed people. Mm-hmm. Um, that was that tapped into an '80s nostalgia. I mean, Stranger Things obviously t- touches it in right. big time. But you're able to do it. Can you? Can you discuss what you were thinking about? Because I mean, obviously, you understand what I'm saying. I mean, it is definitely oh, yeah. a nostalgia thing to to watch this documentary. Yeah, no, nostalgia is kind of uh, my brand. If I if I had one, because I've done this is my third feature documentary, and all three of them are pretty much rooted in the '90s, and. I, as a human, am also pretty much rooted in the 90s. You know, I still (laughs) love, I collect action figures and and VHS tapes and vinyl records. And I'm, you know, I am my target audience, which is a really important thing. I think as a filmmaker, for anybody, you know, make stuff. If if you need to figure out how to to get through to an audience, just figure out what you like. And if there's enough other people like you in the world, then you have an audience and I've done it um, with all three movies. And the thing that I kind of figured out really early on my first one, um, when we did Kickstarter to raise the money is, you know, with Kickstarter, you can raise some money, but you also build a community that is invested in this thing. And you found through the internet now, like-minded people, you know, my first movie was way more niche. It was about a single one hit wonder band uh, called The Refreshments. And there's not a ton of Refreshments fans, but I found them all and I sent them to the Kickstarter. And then my second movie was a little bit bigger. It was about the music genre ska, right? So No Doubt, Real Big Fish, The Mighty Mighty Boss Tones, a lot more fans. And I found them. And that Kickstarter went bananas. And I still, you know, have the email list and I'm still pushing those DVDs and trying to get those people, but I'm engaged in that community because I'm also a fan of that thing from that era. Um, and then with Blockbuster, it was the same thing. You know, I grew up loving it. And when I walked into that Blockbuster for the first time, I had that wave of nostalgia that, like I said, that first day was when I asked if we could film there because if I, I figured if I could capture any of that feeling that I felt going there, and then try to sell it to people who are my similar age and have my similar life experiences of those Friday nights at Blockbuster Video, and maybe you get a pizza and you know, hanging out with your friends and you rent The Matrix and oh my God, and then you watch all the special features and then you watch it again because it's not due back till Monday, like that feeling, it's gone in the world now. So being able to tap into that. Um, you know, just from like you're getting at the marketing standpoint of like how do you, you know, capture this this vibe or this nostalgia and then try to sell it to people. I don't think it's that hard. It's people want it. People long for the the good times, the good old days that we all remember. I mean, you see it in every like you said, Stranger Things in every facet of pop culture, it comes in waves. You know, there's a reboot of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles every six years because new kids don't know what it is, but also because the parents are still going to go back and watch it because oh, I remember Leonardo. That was my favorite, you know? It's, it, yeah, it, it's, I mean, well, I mean, Disney is doing very well with that, with the Marvel and, and, the, and the Marvel and the Star Wars franchises. Yeah, and just reboots in general, reboots and remakes. It's it's the world. Um, I'm thankful to be doing, you know, documentaries are different. I'm not just rebooting short circuit Two. I'm, but you're tapping I'm reminding into... people why they like the original one. Right. So like, you know, you, you're tapping into those, um, those, that time. So like that, 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 the, doc, the um, documentary series on Netflix, the movies that made us, uh, yeah. which is, a, and the toys that made us, which they like mm-hmm. break up, like, you know, the transform, like an hour about how the Transformers came or He-Man came or Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles came or 
like the making of Die Hard or, and they just do it in a very so strategic, nostalgic way. They got me because I watch all of them. Me too. Every season, all of it. I just like, yeah, sure, I'll watch the Barbie one too. I don't care. I want to just, right. <laughs> it's fine. It's part of the series. I got to watch it. Um, but so you you were you were figuring you figured out at the beginning of your of your journey as a filmmaker that you need to find your audience and make product for that audience. Um, so you were using the film entrepreneur method in many ways before you even knew what an entrepreneurial filmmaker was because you're selling, yeah. you're still selling DVDs, you're still selling other products and things, mm-hmm. that, and, and you're, you're still making money off of these old products. Yeah. Well, it's old the same, same kind of thing where I said if you make stuff for yourself and find other people, right, I love physical media. I am the person who if I find an indie movie that I like, I'm going to buy the VHS version because that's cool to me. Or you know, if a band I like puts out an album, I'm going to buy the vinyl record whether I listen to it on the turntable or not, because that's cool to me. You know, I'm, I like movie posters. I like things like that. So it was easy then to think, well, if I like that, maybe the people who like my movie would also like a poster or a hat or a t-shirt or, you know, if I could make action figures, I would, but yeah. it's weird with documentaries. <laughs> <laughs> that would be, but yeah, I, I, um, Tiger, Tiger King would obviously have them. Uh, <laughs> right. No, I listened to your, your book, the film entrepreneur book. Uh, and I, as it was going through, I'm like, Oh yeah, I do that. I do that. I do that. Mm-hmm. I do that. Oh, that's a good idea. I haven't tried, but I do that one and I do that. And it all kind of works in different levels depending on the project too. You know, I've done three of these and you know, I blockbuster sells a lot more VHS copies obviously than the other ones. do. Right. Exactly. And you, you, I mean, being strategic like that to tap into that nostalgia and it, and it's something that just keeps going. It does like I, I accidentally made a nostalgia film with On the Corner of Eagle and Desire, <laughs> which was about, you know, filmmakers at Sundance. Um, sure. For, yeah, for now people, that we can't go to film festivals, like, it's a relic. I don't think there's going to be a time like it was even a year or two ago at Sundance the same way when there's 50,000 people jammed into Park City. Like, I don't, I don't know if that's ever going to happen again or if it's going to be complete. I don't think what I was able to capture will be there again and it wasn't yeah. it wasn't strategic i can't say like yeah there's a pandemic coming so i know people <laughs> but I, in many ways i made like a christmas movie because every year now around sundance time people are like well i didn't get into sundance but at least i could i could watch sundance um yeah you know watch and and, and be there it kind of feel like it'd be there so it, it was kind of like a weird nostalgia <laughs> as well unintended unintended nostalgia yeah yeah we we didn't get into sundance as well but we um, turned our lemons into lemonade and we put the rejection letter quote, the, the nice, the one nice thing they said, we put that in our trailer and actually God, our so distributor was like, are you sure you can put that in there? We had to prove that Sundance had said it. <laughs> hey, look, I mean, when I, I, I've been rejected so many times from Sundance, I can't, I've lost count. But, um, but early on, I would just say, um, I would put the laurels on my website for some of my short films and I would say officially rejected really lot in a Sundance Film Festival. Officially hey, rejected. you paid for it can you know yeah <laughs> so it's that's a hundred dollar like, graphic <laughs> exactly <laughs> well i just i try to get in there early so it was only 50. uh okay good. So i wasn't the we i wasn't the guy that just showed up last minute that's 125 dollars. <laughs> that's ridiculous but yeah. uh now one thing i did notice about your your film and the music you guys had like you had a couple of songs there that i'm like that can't be cheap how did you get the the rights to S- Smash Mouth, um, which yeah. is a very it was I forgot, is it All Star? It was it All Star. It's All Star, it, yeah. All Star. So All Star is like probably one of the more licensed Smash Mouth songs mm-hmm. that's been in a million big movies, and I can't believe that was cheap. So can you tell us how you got those rights? Because I'm assuming you're not rolling deep enough to to drop 150 or 200 thousand dollars for that that needle. Right. <laughs> Yeah, no, we did not. <laughs> we did not spend what we were supposed to spend. Um, no, that came from, uh, like I said, my other movie. I was working on two at a time. It's about ska music, and Smash Mouth was part of that scene. So I had approached um, their guitar player, who is their primary songwriter, to be in that documentary. Um, 
and he was a cool guy and we were hanging out and my uh, producer for Blockbuster was there with me because to save money, you know, I'm, if I'm flying to LA, I'm going to shoot both, you know, interviews for both movies at the same time because it saves me 500 bucks in plane tickets, right? Mm -hmm. So we probably, I think we came from, I can't remember the, maybe the Adam Brody shoot or something and went straight to the Smash Mouth shoot. And so he was there with me. So after we were done talking about ska music, we started talking about home video rentals and blockbuster video. And he had some fun takes that actually made it into the movie. Um, so that's pro tip number one is if you want to hit song, find the person who wrote it and put them in your movie. <laughs> Fair enough. So we reached out when we were doing the music. We thought, wouldn't it be fun if we put a couple needle drops in here that were songs from the 90s, early 2000s that were big in movies that people associate with blockbuster videos sub subconsciously, right? Like Smash Mouth All-Star was in Shrek and Shrek was a huge home video hit because kids, you know, every week, can I get it? Can I, you know, it's before you could stream anything. So um, it was an obvious choice and we knew the guy. So we reached out and said, hey, can we get this song? You know, is there any way we can get it? for free you know in music docs you can get a lot of music for free if you know the right people and he was like well we do own all the rights but we can't do free but i can get you the really good friends and family discount and that that knocked it down a ton i mean i'm talking like 90 percent off and so it was only a couple thousand dollars but we didn't have enough money and you know, we have no real budget we're self-funding everything after the kickstarter money dried up and um so the way music licensing works is you got to pay for two licenses. You have the publishing and then the master. So the publishing is the songwriter, whoever wrote it, they get paid. And the master is whoever recorded it. So a lot of times it's the same people, right? The Beatles wrote and recorded their own songs. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times somebody else wrote it, so you got to pay two different people. Um, in this case, they own both, both sides, but they doubled the price. so. Me being a musician, there's another pro tip for indie filmmakers out there. I just recorded it myself. We did a sound alike. I played all the instruments except the drums. I had my, my buddy do the drums and I sang it. I figured I could do a pretty good smash mouth impression. I got a gravelly voice. And that's the version in our movie is just me doing a cover of Smash Mouth because it was half the price. Um, and we did the same thing. There's another hit song in there, and it was my producer's wife is also a professional singer, and she sang the other song so that it wouldn't, you know, give away our secret. But it's in the credit, so it's not really a secret. But so that's yeah, all so star, that's, written by Smash Mouth, performed by Taylor Morton. So, so <laughs> you know, it, that's a, that's a really great tip because even for for not even for docs, but for features as well. You can, mm -hmm. you if you can get the songwriter to give you the, the rights at an affordable price, which a lot of times the songwriter will give it to you for an affordable right. It's generally the yeah. master, whoever owns the master, which is that mm -hmm. the, the original recording, that's where the money. Those are the, the big record labels, yeah. And they're not. Giving and then a lot of times they'll do a most favored nations deal where you have to pay the same for both. So even if you can get the publishing, you know, for a thousand bucks, which is cheap. Uh, the master holder might want 10 grand and then you have to pay 10 grand for both. So now it's 20 because of the way they work those deals. So it's, it's a slippery slope, but yeah, if you, even if you just know somebody, you know, find a local band you like and say, hey, I'll pay for your studio time, go record me a version of this song. That's also why you hear so many covers now in movies and in trailers, especially like, it's always like a cool modern cover of an 80s song. Well, a lot of times it's way cheaper to do that than to get the real song. And that's another great, great tip. Like again, you To watch the rest of this interview, head over to IndieFilmHustle.com.